Hello, and welcome to another edition of Smart History. I'm your host, Stephen Zucker, appearing without my former partner, Beth Harris. And uh, if you're watching this, please answer my calls, Beth. Today we'll be learning about Andy Warhol's Maryland Diptych. This was one of Warhol's seminal works. It was created in 1962, which was an important year in both the art world as well as the world of popular culture. I think to really gain a better understanding of the Maryland Diptych, we first have to look at pop art and Warhol's work on a broader scale. Pop art was really about asking the question, what is art? Similarly to Duchamp and his fountain decades earlier, Warhol and other pop artists tried to really change the viewer's definition of art. For example, Lichtenstein appropriated consumable images from comic books, making the viewer look at those comic book images as higher forms of art. In a similar way, with his soup cans, Warhol forced the viewer to examine the industrial products of the era as a form of art. Looking at the Maryland diptych with this knowledge, we can begin to understand that the work was, in part, an industrial commentary, as well as a commentary in popular culture, as the genre's name implies. Marilyn Monroe died in August of 1962 after committing suicide by overdosing on sleeping pills. This had a major impact on the popular culture because of the massive fame which Monroe had garnered over the years. In other words, the cult of celebrity. This inspired Warhol, who was greatly affected by the obsession with celebrity and the objectification of fame. Because of this, he created dozens of work with the subject matter of Monroe's celebrity and death. This is perhaps most clearly reflected in the form which his Maryland diptych took. As suggested by the name, it was a diptych, or two-panel work, recalling earlier forms of religious art which had utilized the same diptych form. You can also see the allusion to religious art in Warhol's Gold Marilyn Monroe, a piece that utilizes the same gold background as Byzantine icons. In doing so, he essentially emphasized the deification of Monroe and compared the cult of celebrity to the cult of the Virgin Mary. Another interesting thing to note, and perhaps most obvious, is the repetition of the image of Monroe. The depictions of Monroe, sourced from a 1953 publicity shot from the movie Niagara, are stacked to appear as though they are products on a shelf. They were organized a lot like his soup cans, so you can really make the connection to Marilyn Monroe being an industrial product, rather than a person. We, as the viewer, are not presented with the real Marilyn, a depressed, suicidal woman, similar to my own feelings after Beth, after Beth left me, but are rather subjected to a mere mask of stardom and beauty, like the mask of happiness I put on every day to hide my inner turmoil. Beth! When I first looked at the Maryland diptych, what really struck me was the powerful way that Warhol utilized repetition and color. It's really a commentary on the power of images, where Warhol is stating, if one image is powerful, then 20 images are 20 times as powerful. It's a lot like advertisements plastered on construction site walls, which try to yell at the viewer for attention. As the viewer, we can also take this connection even further, looking at how the multiplicity of images represents the popular culture's oversaturation with Monroe and the cult of celebrity. The color and repetition are also used by Warhol to suggest the fading of celebrity and really create a strong connection to Monroe's suicide. On the left panel, Monroe is vibrant and colorful, but as the viewer's eye wanders from left to right, the right panel appears black and white, fading and smudging Monroe's image. This symbolically represents Monroe's demise and the temporary nature of celebrity. I think it's also interesting to look at the opposing sides of the diptych as a representation of the two sides of Marilyn. The left side is her fame and celebrity, while the right side is her depression and death. I also personally view the left panel as an allusion to my happiness with Beth. Oh, Beth. And the right panel to my crippling depression and, and divorce. Come on, Stephen, you can get through this. Just breathe. Remember what your therapist said. Breathe through it. <laughs> uh, Beth? Uh, I'm sorry about that little outburst. Another thing that is fascinating is Warhol's method of production. Warhol actually had to move to an industrial studio space, which he nicknamed the factory. Here, as the name suggests, Warhol used industrial processes to produce his art. This included silk screening, which allowed Warhol to produce high-quality reproductions for use in his art. However, at the beginning of his career, Warhol carefully painted items such as his soup cans, but later he relied on silk screening more. The way that Warhol made the work paralleled the message he was trying to send, that as the world is increasingly industrialized, volume matters. 
The global culture chews up and spits out images so rapidly. It seems that an artist can only compete by adopting commercial or industrial techniques. In the same way that images are chewed up and spit out. Beth chewed me up and spit me out. God damn it, Beth. What we had was real. Just talk to me. I need to hear the melodic tones of your voice. To smell the fragrant perfume of your aura. Oh, Beth. Oh, Beth.